I noticed sometimes we come off mute. We're live now. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that being said, hello. <laughs> We're live. Today is um, September 25th, Monday, uh, 2023. This is a scheduled uh, city council workshop. It is uh, 5 15. Around the table, we have uh, Councilor Tremble, Councilor Yakabaga, Councilor Leonard. Councillor Schaefer, <laughs> Councillor Davitt, <laughs> Councillor Sprague, myself, Councillor Fournier, with Morton on the line. And you're joined with uh, City Manager uh, Deb Rory. So, first up is uh, ARPA discussion, and specifically uh, <clears throat> Health Equity Alliance. Alliance. Yeah. Mm. So, um, We've uh, had a an initial discussion on this. There was some requests from additional information, um, and then there was a, a retooling, if you will, of the application. Um, it basically is proposed for similar services. It's just the, the point of delivery is different. So um, they did get in a proposed, a revised proposed. Um, application last week. It's really related to the budget. Um, what it would do is it would um, split the operation. Um, just for background, the Health Equity Alliance application was to create a resource center and to fund outreach workers um, to specifically with a focus on downtown. Um, the resource center would allow individuals um, who have certain medical conditions to be treated also an opportunity to build a rapport and a relationship and the billing for those treatments um, would in essence provide, you know, funding for the ongoing operations. Part of, after the, after the initial um, review of this application, there were a number of questions that were asked. Um, so they had developed, um, Pro form is assuming a positive cash flow at six months as well as nine months. The applicant stated that the industry standard for medical practice is six months to obtain positive cash flow. This project has a 90 day ramp up period before operationally um, and further working with Medicaid 340B and a transient population with insurance document challenges all result in some barriers to immediate returns. Uh, the applicant stated that the six-month performer that they did provide was unrealistic, and that the nine-month performer is more realistic, but incredibly optimistic. Both of those operating projections are included in the new packet. Um, from the initial proposal, there was a request to hear uh, from the downtown partnership. Um, you know, the downtown partnership, while supportive of their um, work that he was proposing and understanding the need for that work, um, they were um, very concerned about the proposed location on Columbia Street, as it is you know, surrounded on all sides by residential buildings, offices, restaurants, retail locations, and the main Discovery Museum. Um, they've heard a chorus of safety issues and sanitation concerns regarding people who are struggling. Um, rather than mitigating these issues, the, the concern was the project may have the unintended consequences of exacerbating them. So um, they're preference was that it be placed in an area that is closely connected to or very near other essential resource organizations and where clients would not find themselves at odds with competing needs. Um, we I believe that was the additional information that was requested, but I did include all of the relevant information and iterations um, because the more time goes by, the more we go. What happens? So, uh, the revised proposal looks uh, substantially different. The one big shift is to move the resource center um, to the Hancock Street uh, location where our offices currently are. They are proposing that outreach would remain in downtown. Um, the resource center would be open seven days a week. Um, and the, um, as would outreach. Um, both are expected to operate 8.30 to 5. Um, and I guess I'll stop there to see what other questions or concerns. By bifurcating the operations, the revised budget does include different rent assumptions, 
and it does it require a vehicle to be able to transport folks. Question, comment? I think Councilor Trumbull was right ahead of me. Well, right. uh, go ahead. I saw you. <laughs> and then I saw Leonard and then I saw Trumbull. Okay. I, my it. peripheral was not <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And I um I really appreciate the work that Josh and Heal have put into this um in terms of working with other stakeholders in downtown and um coming with other options. Um I mean, I would have originally supported all of this at the Columbia Street, um, especially in particularly given that it was gonna um, address things like bathrooms and somewhere for folks to go seven days a week, which is something we hear a lot about um, for downtown concerns, but um, the way that they're willing to make it work so they can be um, do that and offer it on Hancock Street seven days a week, I think is great. Um, and I support the outreach being um, on Columbia because it does sound like it addresses um, some of the DDP and other concerns as far as who will be there when. Um, so um, I'll make the motion now that I would uh, support fully funding uh, the $694,700, um, which would include, from my understanding, the um, vehicle that would be mm -hmm. necessary at the new location. I'll second that. Okay, Councilor Leonard. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I, I just wanted to thank uh, uh, Josh, Betsy, and Eric for really uh, getting into that collaboration over the weekend. Um, I, I did have a, a question um, and, you know, I, I hate to put a uh, public health on the spot, um, but I was wondering if uh, they had any uh, 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 statements in regards to this project or, or if the Bangor PD had anything related to that. If, if they don't, I, I understand if it, if it wasn't in their periphery, but I just wanted to know from their perspective how they saw this project overall. You know, we we really look to the council to provide the direction that you all want um, to pursue. Mm -hmm. You know, I will say that, you know, selfishly from that, from the outreach provision that the city has, you know, I'd really like to see this become part of the joint effort so that we aren't, again, continuing to silo outreach efforts by organizations. Um, and to make it more of a collaborative effort as we move forward into what I would call post encampment work. That's what Trumbull. Yeah, I actually had a similar question on that. You know, does this fall in line with what we're trying to accomplish? And also, now that we've they've adjusted their plan as a downtown group on board with this new plan. I had asked that follow up question to. I'm not getting any. Reaction. <laughs> so I believe yeah. that the downtown would be okay. concerned about the unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. um, I had a meeting. I had our regular meeting with the downtown partnership last week, and and I did verify with Josh and say, you know, we need to make sure that the downtown is on board. Um, and if you all want, you know, a, a statement position from the downtown, I had suggested that that be part of that. Submission as well. So, um, can we have this kind of collaboration between the city, the public health department, and HEAL prior to executing this program? Like to have a plan in place. Mm -hmm. This is exactly these are the points and uh, th these are the goals. What like what does the, the city or the public health department expect from here to achieve? Let's say in six months from now, I I feel there ha there has to be this kind of collaboration if if we want this to be successful and to be uh, seen as a good sign. You know, like you know, as if we're working with the partnership and right. with, with business uh, in downtown area. Mm -hmm. Um, to have some goals, I would say. Okay. And I want to follow up on what uh, Councillor Sprigg always says about we need to have a plan and to have goals. I feel this is where, where I am here. Councillor Schaefer. Um, my thoughts are just about uh, making sure that the outreach workers were also working with their in direct communication with our BCAT team mm -hmm. for when things needed that level of support. Mm -hmm. um, and is there, this sounds very capitalist, but if, if, if giving these services provide, you know, is reimbursable, is there gonna, I mean, I guess if there's a whole bunch of people that wanna help folks out downtown to get the reimbursement, that's probably good for us. But is there gonna be any sort of um, 
I don't know what, the, what I'm looking for here, but is, it, is there going to be any cons to having it be the kind of thing that providing services is going to offer funding for the program? That'd be, mm -hmm. If that question makes sense. It didn't wholly. I'm not going to lie. Right. Well, it's just, you know, like, is it, is it, we're not going to call BCAT because if we call BCAT, we can't get reimbursed for helping this person. Well, but remember, BCAT is the alternative to a police response okay. for an individual who does not necessarily need a, a law enforcement response. Okay. Um, I think that as long as there does need to be collaboration, there does need to be understanding of the other resources that are available in the community. And there does need to be a clear protocol as to how folks will be shepherded, if you will, to the most appropriate okay. response. Councilor Trumbull. Yeah, we're struggling a little bit because I think if you look at the program, it just seems like what it seems like the type of program the APRA funds are really meant to take care of the population they're serving. But at the same time, you know, is it sustainable? What happens when the you know their grant runs out? Is there a plan that I mean, we we were hoping to fund programs that are going to be sustainable. Uh, right. Is this a sustainable? So according to their projections, they do believe it is sustainable based on 340B and Medicaid reimbursements. Mm -hmm. I will say um, that the 340B, it was kind of an eye opener to see how much you could actually buy a prescription for mm -hmm. and turn around and actually refill it or in essence, mm -hmm. get the additional money back. It's it's kind of an eye opener. So. I did include within those projections the number of individuals that would have to be currently in treatment um, to make those financial projections work. Mm -hmm. So, for example, under the nine month scenario, um, you know, uh, Hep C, you know, you build with one and then you go to three and then you go to five a month. Um, the PREP, pre exposure prophylaxis. I'm not going to say that right, which from five to seven to be sustainable. Um, and then some main care, uh, main care chapter 93. That's sort of the home program. Um, they estimate maybe getting to six a month. So in essence, it is treating um, 18 individuals a month to be able to generate revenue to, to cover the operating costs of, of both the resource and the center itself and theoretically the outreach as well. Thanks. So the only hesitation I've got is I think they've made some a lot of accommodations here, but I'm still getting a sense that the the downtown group isn't fully on board with this. I don't know, just the sense I'm getting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is exactly what's concerning me because uh, I want to make sure all sites are on the same page before we proceed with this. Um, as we are listening to to the needs uh, the needs of un unhoused population in our downtown and in Bangor, at the same time, I want to make sure we we are listening to everyone else. So just to be fair to everyone, mm -hmm. um, I want to go back follow up on other councillors' comments about collaboration between BCAT and mm -hmm. and this program. I feel like in this program, it's it's going to be continuation of the work of the CAT team in a way. What kind of collaboration we're talking about mm -hmm. here? How how are we going to achieve our goals? It's um, we are not duplicating efforts. We are not. It's, it's there's a lot like there's a lot to it that I truly mm -hmm. want to explore. Okay. Councilor Sprague. Uh, this is a very complicated proposal. Um, I think nowhere in the proposal is there could I find any clear indication of the number of individuals that were felt to be downtown who would use the drop-in center, whether it's 5, 10, 15. Uh, there's no indication of how many would actually drop in because we can't compel people who are now at the library to be uh, bust over to Harlow Street and throw them out of the library and tell them to go somewhere else. There's, there's no real mechanism to assure that they will want to go where the services are available. Uh, there's no demonstration in the project of any real collaboration with the outreach coordinators, with PCHC, with the public health department. This is uh, a siloed proposal. Um, it is, uh, which I don't, I don't think we should be supporting. 
Um, I think it's a feel good type of thing to support. Because as Council Trimble said, you know, it's, these are the people who COVID funds were supposed to help. But we also said we weren't really trying to fund uh, just operational expenses. And I truly do not believe that this is sustainable without substantial ongoing grant funding. The 340B program is a high risk model to, uh, to fund this. And it gets at that this is an outreach center that's disguising a medical practice or a medical practice that's disguised as an outreach center. Uh, you know, there were comments in this that the pro formas that uh, medical practices were not expected to come up to generating revenue within six to nine months. Uh, but if this is a medical practice site, then it's not really clear when it's combined with just saying, gee, we have a lot of people downtown who need a place to drop in when they're inactive. Uh, they're too, you know, they're, it's very, very blurred. Um, I am very much concerned with the lack of, uh, demonstrated lack of collaboration with all the other projects that are going on in town. Uh, we've uh, agreed with a fresh start to essentially another medical practice for maybe a different group of people, but another medical practice up on Center Street. Uh, we've got uh, a substantial proposal for PCAC to expand their space. And, and some of the people who are out there are people who wander downtown during the day and are looking for a, a, a drop-in center. Um, I think there is uh, this looks. And, and to say that uh, we're going to start up with 9.6 full-time equivalents, 9.6 people to take care of how many people? 15? Really? 9.6 individuals, $600,000 of operating costs, and, and no real high probability of sustainability. Uh, so I, I think that it would be a tremendous mistake to fund this project. Dr. Schaefer? Um, well, I disagree. But uh, I also think that while I definitely value the, the DVP's input, not doing it isn't going to mean that there are people no longer downtown and not in the library. And if, you know, we funded... I think the collaboration piece comes with what we've already funded. We funded a social worker for the library. Social work at the library can be like, hey, you know, you maybe you don't want to sit here and feel uncomfortable. Make, you know, kids can't don't feel like they can go to the library because you're here. We can get you a ride down to this other place and get you some help and take that. And that is maybe a, a different approach. Um, not funding it is not going to make people not be loading at the library or wherever. I'm using the libraries as an example. There's other places. Instead, if it was an alternative to the library, hey, we have Wi-Fi, we have bathrooms, we have, you know, comfy couches, you can hang out and not be in the thick of downtown and we'll even give you a ride. We'll take you there. I feel like that's something to try. And it, you know, it's a little not in my downtown, you know, but uh, to have an alternative or an option for folks it, it's something to try and as far as the operation I, I have said all along I don't want to fund jobs to have them taken away but this proposal says that it is startup costs that it's not that they would be able to make it sustainable um I uh, so I I see this as I think it's worth trying Councilor Davitt um, thank you. Yeah, I echo some of what Councillor Schaefer has said. Um, I think that what Josh and Heal have done to work with DBP and then just other downtown stakeholders um, has been really impressive and shows that their, their dedication. Um, I definitely respect Councillor Yacobaga's um, points on wanting, wanting folks to all be on board, but I, I do think that that's never going to be completely possible. Um, on something like this. And I think that that move, be, moving the outreach out of downtown or the resource center out of downtown is a huge step. Um, one that I, I I do unfortunately think lessens the impact of, of what they're trying to do. But I mean, we've, we've signed multiple contracts with HEAL before, the collaboration between the city and, and HEAL. We've been doing that for years. Um, so that's not a big collaboration. Our average, they've been doing this for right. This is not them working with other members and other organizations is not new. Um, and there's a longstanding um, example of how that works. Um, and I guess I apologize if I'm just sort of like, just 
tired <laughs> because we've gone in circles so many times with this and brought things back to the table so many times. And we hear constantly that some of the number one resources that people want in, in downtown and when they're concerned about folks who are, who are transient, who are unhoused, who are sub sub suffering from substance use or mental health issues is somewhere for them to be on weekends or somewhere for them to be inside that's not just the library. I know we can't compel people to go elsewhere, but they have no other option and compelling doesn't even matter. Um, and bathrooms, we hear again and again and again about bathrooms, and we need other public restrooms in downtown Bangor. I don't think anyone disagrees on this. Um, but there are option for folks. And even if it's if it's having to go over to Hancock Street, like that's better than nothing. But I get I think we're never gonna have hundred percent of the council on board, we're never gonna have hundred percent of the community on board and all of these different areas, and we need to act if we're gonna do this. Um, as many people point out, winter is almost here. Um, we start getting chilly. If there, if this is something they're going to do, if the majority of the council supports it happening, then like we need to make that happen. Um, so that's I just a little tired and frustrated, but I'd really like folks to to see how important this the resources and how much we've been asking for this, and they're trying to address what we as the community has asked for. Councilor Yakabaga. I mean, I, I truly hear you, like Councillor David, absolutely. And when we talk about collaboration, I'm not talking about not supporting this. I know I talked to, to Josh earlier and, and he knows like we need this program. At the same time, uh, when we talk about collaboration, I wanna make sure Department of Public Health is, is sitting and chatting with, with Heal and having a plan before we approve this. This is just, I want to make sure we are on the, on the same page and, and the outcome is what we are looking for. Mm -hmm. It's, um, I know the city uh, collaborated with Hill before. I, I want to see again, like to, to be back at the table and because at one point there was some, I don't want to say uh, frustration, but I think at one point it was not the best outcome that the city wanted from Hill at one point. And then things got better for sure, but I, that's why I would like to have this, you know, with Josh. I know you, you're you're good at this, reaching out and having conversations. That's why I want to see this collaboration before we pass this to make sure we have the best outcome possible. Council Weiner, I, uh, I I I share your concerns, Councillor Sprague, uh, in in regards to a lot of um, the, the the foresight. At the same time, um, I am very aware that uh, we have businesses in downtown Bangor that, uh, like even at, at my, my family's restaurant, even Ruse, there are people who use the restroom all the time there that, uh, you know, we, we try to be as accommodating as possible, but um, it's, uh, we need to have more options for people. And with winter on the horizon, there's going to be more and more people utilizing uh, the library and other places as shelters. And um, I think um, if this project were to go forward and we want to enact this to get the full services possible for this coming winter, uh, I mean, it's going to take uh, a decent amount of time to get this project started. And, um, and the resource center is by far the most important aspect of this project. Um, what um, I know we already have a, a proposal on the table, but I would um, hearing the concerns from the downtown Bangor partnership and having uh, conversations with the uh, um, heel beforehand. I know it's not ideal, but I know that the resource center is is the priority in this uh, objective. What I might suggest in order to um, hear the concerns of the partnership and hear the concerns of uh, other citizens is um, if we were to go forward to support the initiative for the resource center but not for columbia street um, that would be something that i would like to have a discussion on but um, i'm also open to being told that's also a terrible idea as well Councilor trumbull well i first just want to say i'm pretty much where Councilor yakovaki is on this but I think that's an interesting idea, but it also seems like, how do you get the people to resource center if you don't have the outreach center? Right. So, um, but I, I appreciate that trying to find something that works. And nobody, I don't think there's anybody at the table that wants to wrap up these APRA discussions more than I do. But I don't want to just do it to get it over with either. So I'm, I'm, I'm still a little not, not, I'm not there yet on this. 
Councillor Sprague. No, no, just reiterate that, that this is <clears throat> seven tenths of a million dollars. It's for 9.6 equivalent FTEs without a demonstration of how many people are going to be taken care of. It's, and it's a, a lot of people, a lot of resource to establish a resource center, but it's not establishing a resource center. In order to get paid, it's establishing a treatment center, a medical practice, essentially, getting funded off of a program where you buy drugs cheap and you sell them at their retail and you take the money and you plow it back into financing it. I do not believe that that is going to turn out to be a sustainable operation. There is also no demonstration here of how this project will reduce any of the siloing that's currently taking place among different agencies. If there were four or five agencies, Bangor Homeless Shelter and the library and the public health department and PCHC were in the room today <laughs> giving their support for this project and saying that this will make our lives easier, then I might be swayed. But in the absence of that, which isn't included in any way in the project, I don't see how this is going to improve collaboration or reduce the fragmentation of the efforts that are currently being made. And it's a very expensive way to not end up with a result that significantly reduces that fragmentation. Thanks. Seeing nobody else. Oh, Councilor. Just on the idea of collaboration, I, I think that Bangor in general is a pretty collaborative place, but we didn't ask the Bangor Homeless Shelter to be here to support the one and a half million we did for Hope House. We didn't ask um, all the other child care centers to support the millions of dollars we did to do a child care center. We didn't ask for, we didn't require that level of interagency collaboration, collaborative support to advance a to advance, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, if we had, if we asked other agencies to support somebody's ARPA request, we didn't, we took it at what they offered. And I think that setting that bar for this one is setting a different standard than what we have applied to the 16 million, how many have we given out that we've already allocated? We didn't, we didn't ask for that from other people. And it's not fair to ask for that for this. If there was a, a deep seated concern, email us, let us know if there's like, hey, no, absolutely not you know, this is definitely not going to work. Sure, I'd be open to hearing that as, as comment, but I, I just don't understand the standard to set for this one, which is less than many other ones that we've done for this particular topic. So, so that is in particular troublesome to me to, to set a different standard. Um, if we need to table it for people to think about it, to get answers to some of these questions, which I'm pretty sure uh, he'll has based on the body language I'm seeing over Councillor Sprague's shoulder, then let's right. then let's table it. And and you've heard the, the concerns. And I feel like based on the documentation we've gotten, when any other concern has been raised, right. it would be answered. So that said, I'm happy to rescind my motion. It seems like there's enough interest in, in sending it back. Oh, yeah, or oh, second or voted. Everybody's received. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, okay. I unsecond <laughs> or whatever. Awesome. I'm good with Thanks. that. Yeah, no, my two cents were I, I'm not fully on board on fully funding. And I agree with Councilor uh, Sprague on the 340B program. It, I'm not sure that's going to work that big. So. Um, so we will table this and and we'll pull together the parties and have a conversation. Great. All right. All right. Next up, uh, we all had a lovely uh, meeting, the last council meeting with the uh, public comment period that was, I think, uh, handled exceptionally well by staff. And we just kind of killed the the bad or hate speech hate speech uh the inappropriate behavior or language that was happening um i think we're i think we're doing a pretty good job there but anyway councilor trumbull i would agree i think it was handled well is there a way that the, like the chair could get 
I mean, years ago that we used to be like a kill switch that the clerk had, he could shut off a microphone or something. Is there a way he could get a kill switch to shut off like the, the uh, yeah. public comment, you know? No, I mean, it really, it's because whoever's yeah. operating the Zoom. All right. Yeah. Just no, I think the only thing I would say, and it's not necessarily because of the event the other night, but I wouldn't mind if we did move public comment to the end of the meeting. I think it's better for people to come than have business at the council. I've always thought it should be at the end anyway, and this is a good time to talk. This seems like it just seems like it should be at the end of the meeting. So um and then people can have this and especially on Zoom because sometimes I mean we've had meetings where it's been an hour of public comment and there's a lot of people that come and they get business but they before the council. So it just seems like it's uh you know a better process. But I think it was handled well the other night. I think I think it can be able to eliminate that. I think it was a Hopefully it was a one off thing because of that the date that that occurred on, but I hopefully it doesn't continue. Councilor Shaver. I just I just wanted to be clear because because I had somebody ask me after it was written in the paper that three councilors spoke out against it. So I just wanted to make it clear that I think every member of our council <laughs> and as I had somebody ask, like yeah. like like why didn't you speak out against that? And I was like, well, if you watch the video, I'm yelling, stop, 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 <laughs> you know. But just to make it real clear that every, I feel confident speaking for all counselors here, all of us were absolutely horrified by that and did not support that message in any way, shape, or form. That is a misunderstanding that was printed. So I just want to get that out there. Thank you. Yeah, Councilor Davitt. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was going to, so one, I, I don't support moving it to the end, um, the public comment that is to the end, I think. Um, I've seen other communities do that, and it often feels like it's a, it's trying to silence, and I don't want to say that Councilor Trumple, what you're asking for or anyone else, um, but to silence some folks from the public that, um, I mean, we know public comments at 7.30. Committee meet, council meetings can end anywhere from 7.45 to 10 p.m., mm -hmm. um, and so asking people to, to sit by and wait, especially on Zoom, um, for whenever it might be over, um, particularly when we know sometimes our consent agenda is very long or whatever it may be. I don't think it feels fair to the public and sort of defeats the point of public comment. Um, but I would, um, and I think to staff, Cody, like, did a fantastic <laughs> job. Like, there's a the moment where everyone has to process, like, what, what is being <laughs> said, and then, and then he was just on top of it, so I really appreciate that. Um, but I, think, I don't know if it was in our memo or someone's brought it up elsewhere, but as a possibility of just not not just having people say their name and their address, but getting that ahead of time as they sign up in the Zoom link. I know other communities have done that, um, so that so we know ahead of time some sort of context. Um, I know that there's like IP address tracking and stuff that could be done to make sure all four people aren't from the same thing and stuff like that. I think that might be beyond what we need to do, but that would be if there's a way we can have that signed up in the waiting room so people can say who they are. Councilor Yagabaga. I agree with Councilor that, but I. For me, I think it's going to be the same, whether it's in the beginning or at the end. They're going to say something hateful, and all of us will be just shocked. And then, you know, the the IT person will run to, you know, shut them uh, down. And um, so, I, I don't, I don't feel it's going to change anything moving to the end. The, the same hate speech is going to be the same hate speech. So, um, maybe your suggestion as to have. Uh, verification of their addresses and, and where, where are these uh, calls coming from, maybe it would be a better idea. But it's going to be the same again, like, you know, they're going to say what they want to say. We're going to go to Council Leonard, sure. only because he hasn't spoken. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think we should, whoever has their finger on the mouse clicker to the mic uh, on screen um, should just be ready to go like in the future to make sure that if there is some sort of hate speech, just put the entire council meeting on mute and make sure that person's off screen. And then once we verify that they're off screen, we'll get back to the rest of the meeting. Um, in regards to uh, public comments, whether being moved to the end or or forward, I'm, I, I'm, I'm open to that discussion overall. Um, I actually um, was talking to a citizen the other day who um, made public comments sometime last fall and she had an entire prepared speech that she was giving and um i i and i i, I failed to remember her name i so i apologize to you if you're watching um but uh um i thought she had a very good point about um and this might be a good way to further verify if this someone who is going to speak publicly is actually speaking in earnest 
if we actually create a mechanism where if a person supplies their public comment before that they uh, speak, we could one, uh, see what they're going to say, but two, um, I, I actually do like the three minute rule that uh, uh, Councillor uh, Fournier uh, put forward, but we might even go forward to say, hey, if you supplied your public comments beforehand, if it's not a very heavy knife for public comment, we can rescind the uh, the three minute limit so you can finish the rest of what your worded speech is. And we can also potentially have a discussion afterwards if, if we have time for it and whatnot. I think that would be very respectful to voters uh, to um, before they come to meetings, actually write down their thoughts instead of as some uh, citizens come in and just speak right off the top of their head. Um, so uh, I would appreciate seeing that more often, and maybe that's a way to um, incentivize citizens to do that more. I'm sorry. Sure. I do not agree with moving it to the end of the meeting. I think having the beginning, and I and I don't agree with having written comment be provided in advance of any speaking comment. I am totally happy with the written comment being emailed to us, but I feel like that's can be pretty ableist for some folks. There are some, I mean, I think some of the public comments we've had where people are just like, you know, they're in here to complain about their roads or something, and they maybe don't have the technology or the ability or the literacy skills or the confidence in their literacy, literacy skills to write it all down. So I would not want to have it be, I for the Zoom part, I can see um, having some sort of registration before they're added, that there's some sort of verification of, of I mean, when they, when I recognize one of the names on last week's meeting as being the name of a very prolific serial killer. So I was like, that's a weird name to have up there. So having some sort of uh, verification. So that that's where I would stand on it. So I, I is that so, before you go, okay. is that something we can do? You. I mean, you can, but I would also say that pre-registering also feels somewhat limiting. Right. Say if at four or five o'clock in the afternoon, you came across something. Oh, to correct, I didn't mean like, I mean, I just meant like as the meeting pops up. Like like when they pop huh. up and they put in their name, like right. if, if it's- We can spoof, I can put in anybody's name you, I want you can, to. You can put in anybody's right. name, right. but if there is a message sent to the administrator, I, I don't, like if something to explore, because like the, you know, sometimes it's just, I mean, we all kind of know who Mike is. We know right. who Mike is. Right. If we have a new producer back there, they might not know. And so if there's something like that. And then just making sure that our producers back there know the public comment is when you kind of have to be like this. I think he was. Yeah. I think he was. Right. And then, yeah. He, so he is, and he's, he's doing, even more so he's now. He's doing a really good job yeah, as well. So, so, I just, well so I just want to clarify my point because um, I uh, definitely just uh, completely reject the, uh, that my comment was ableist in any way. I was trying to say that that's an option that we can give to people. Of course, if you want to give public comment and not provide a written okay. statement beforehand, that's completely okay. I, I apologize if, if you misinterpret it that way, but that was not at all what I was trying to suggest. If you were to provide written comment and we already knew what you were going to say beforehand and you potentially were going to speak and go over the three minute uh, min minute marker, we know where your speech is going to go. We know where your comments going to go. And so we that might be a reason to uh, I'll actually have your comments written before council so that you can actually finish your entire thoughts. That clarifies things. Okay. <laughs> I thought even everyone had to submit their. No. Here, here's my speech for tonight. <laughs> Any other comments? I'm uh, certainly open to moving all the comments to the end of the meeting. I just only because we have an agenda, and I I think we roll through the agenda fairly quickly, so it's not a, a big time event for people to be sticking around online. To make their comments, but yeah, okay. um, are we in the minority there? So. Good discussion. This is totally unacceptable for public comments to be going in that direction and just to be on the record. Um, as Councilor Shaker said, I, I think we are all in agreement. This is offensive and we're not going there and we'll just shut you down and as as i said to um paul and press herald when they called me up the other day i said and typically we have the police chief sitting in the audience 
to escort people out of this chamber. <laughs> no, it's not here yet. But well, typically, <laughs> to escort people out if something does happen in that regard. So, all right. I think we're good there. Um, we're kind of getting a little short on time. I wanted to be into executive into executive session by uh, quarter after, and we have um, council discussion on homelessness. All right. So this comes forward just as an outcropping of the discussion of the recent DevOps committee, where um, not all councils were present. It was a request to have more of a discussion at the council workshop. Obviously, it was not noticed, so hence the reason it was put on here. Um, in listening to concerns and, and comments, you know, the feedback I gleaned was that um, there was a need and an interest in having perhaps a more balanced approach within our community. Um, our approach, it was clear. We've been very humane, understanding, and collaborative, um, but the efforts don't seem to effectuate change the way we'd like. In fact, there appears to be an increasing number of unhoused individuals within our community and congregating in ways that feel limiting to the public. Uh, use and enjoyment of some properties. So as I typically do, I, I talk with a lot of folks in the community in very different agencies, both city and non-city folks, um, especially those who have regular engagement with those who are unhoused. Um, and most individuals encountered identified as um, one of three, in, in what as being here for one of three ways. Um, the common refrain is they're here for services. Um, the second most common refrain now is they're from the Portland encampments. And uh, the third um, um, statement being made is that they do have some loss of housing. So uh, for folks who are being told you can come here and get services, um, let's be clear, we really do have services, but these services are available typically where you are now and it doesn't look much different. We are at capacity. We do not have an excess uh, amount of resource to share and to provide with others. And if we did, we would certainly be reaching out and extending that hand. The shelters at the moment are near capacity. Uh, Bangor Homeless Shelter is actually undergoing some renovations in the off season that have taken a few beds out of place. Um, if an individual wants to access or someone from somewhere else wants to access one of our shelters, you must contact the shelter first. You must determine if there is available bed of it. And you must determine the intake time. There are prescribed processes that have to be followed. Um, true, we have social, medical, and recovery services um, available um, here, but they're also available in the region, the state, and elsewhere in the country. Um, those that are making service statements, no one's able to determine where this sediment is shared by any of our interactions. Um, people don't get that specific with us. Um, and it's it's really, while it's helpful information to try to trace back to the root cause that may be tipping some folks, it's, it's not crucial to the work we're doing, which is trying to get them, an individual, into a better place. Um, so within the last couple of weeks, um, here are some interactions. Uh, one individual said, I was told there were services here. I need an appointment with a specialist. Okay, well, that's a six month wait for anybody anywhere in the country. But somehow they thought by coming here because we have services, they would get this specialized service much quicker. Um, last week it was, I'm here as I was told, I would be housed uh, by winter if I came to Bangor. It's really disheartening when people have been misled in those ways. Uh, virtually all individuals I've spoken with, both city and non-city have confirmed unhoused individuals sharing that they were previously within encampments in Portland. Uh, we don't have that next layer of information down as to how those individuals arrived here, uh, nor which encampment they may have previously been part of. Was it the encampment that the state DOT, was it within the state DOT lot that was dismantled, or is it another encampment site within Portland? Um, and yes, a loss of housing is contributing to the new faces, but it is the third uh, the third reason that we hear when it comes up. So what are we currently doing? Uh, we're actively engaged with what we're working on, the final steps of the encampment behind Hope House, as well as identifying, assisting others throughout our community, 
and ensuring and enforcing curfews are followed within our parks and open space. The Hope House encampment, those working on this project share that approximately, they didn't have the numbers in front of them and they were talking to the direct care workers last week and they, they estimate it's 20 individuals have been housed and several more are in various stages. Um, due to the number of individuals, the ever-changing population and the pullback of resources to the team, it has taken longer than anticipated, but we have begun closing um, the area in stages as individuals were housed, areas were cleared and posted. It is a constant discussion um, to try to ensure that those closed areas remain clear. We'd like to continue the closure efforts in a couple of ways. There are a number of individuals who will refuse to engage in any manner for months. There are a number of individuals engaged in behavior that puts the well being and safety of others in the encampment in danger. And as this is city property, um, we'd like to use the collaborative decision making process of the outreach and those directly involved to begin providing notice to those not engaging or engaging in dangerous behavior. Notice that they must vacate the property. If they fail to comply, it would require law enforcement support. Um, this is meant to ensure the safety of others and to begin to um, spread the word that we will devote resources to those who really wanna actively participate. And please be clear that actively participate doesn't mean doing exactly what somebody asks you to do the moment you say to do it. It means you have to be willing to take a step, the step that is comfortable for you, the step you are able to make based on where you are in your particular certain situation. I'd also like to consider, say that we consider setting new limiting um, new sites to individuals who were displaced within Bangor um, and try to keep and work through the folks that we have, continue to make sure that an individual who becomes unhoused in Bangor has a safe space to be. We would rather than be in a different space, but um, continue to at least allow access. Um, some of the thoughts that I heard that came up during the GovOps committee was their concerns about uh, shopping cart maintenance, um, concerns about the reunification approach that we use, ensure, enhancing the equitable access to public spaces during the day, um, and kind of get some additional feedback from counselors as to, are you comfortable with the Hope Hat and the next steps behind the Hope House? Because we will work with the outreach teams to help effectuate that. And are there other areas that you'd like to see a shift? That's a trouble. Anything, Hope House plan sounds good. Um, I'm concerned, and I don't know if this is what we're finding, that the pipeline we had for housing is going to start to dry up because of the experiences of people that have helped us in the last, previous times have not had good experiences with the tenants we've given them. So I don't know if it, seeing that pipeline dry up a little bit or is still getting. So it's interesting, uh, even so we had, I know of a couple specifically that had some poor experiences. Yeah. Um, and I've actually been in contact with both of those. So. Um, those are two I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I'm guessing they're the yeah. same two. Um, and so, you know, we, we actually continue. I got an email over the weekend from um, an agency that just sends out blind notices of these. This is these are the units I have available. So they still mm -hmm. okay. seem to be with us. Right. And the other thing, um, I think yeah, I'm sure it's very frustrating for the staff because everybody's working hard. I mean, and I haven't heard this term we we used a couple of years ago, but now it's something for zero. We're built for zero. I haven't heard mm -hmm. that term lately. I don't know what if that group's still out there doing anything, but hopefully they're still working on this. I know it was a, it wasn't really zero, but it was like functional, functional zero. zero. Yeah. So um, it'd be good to get an update on mm -hmm. that. But in that regard, I think it's like, okay, we, we dealt with the encampment on the Kineska, we're dealing with the only And it's kept, and it's been And it's great, right, yeah. But then it's not those people that have relocated. It's like you said, Correct. people come in from out of town and everybody says, oh, well, once they're here, there are, the citizens of Bangor, we can't treat them any different. I agree. I think everybody's a compassionate people, and we obviously want to help people that want help, need help, but we can't, our resources aren't unlimited, mm -hmm. and we don't want to, there's a difference between somebody comes to Bangor, they're an addict, they need to get in some kind of treatment, right. or somebody that comes to Bangor, and they just think it's a great lifestyle to hang out on the streets of Bangor all night long and, and be a zombie in the morning and just walk across the street without looking where the Going, which people, I mean, people are lucky they haven't hit people. They just mm -hmm. walk out in the middle of the street with 
is whatever they're on. So I think this, we need to differentiate between the homeless population as well. And I think you, you did bring up the uh, uh, panhandling oh, to so, uh, well, yep. intersections. And yep. I know you had brought up a number of months ago about seeing some signs about yep. how people could donate. And I just heard or uh, read something recently about a community in Florida that had yep. those signs, but they did it in conjunction with saying you couldn't panhandle within 150 right. feet of it. I don't know if they From a safety panhandle. perspective. Right, because public because safety. We, so right. you could so they don't eliminate panhandling, but they say you can't do it within so many feet of an intersection. Yep. And they put those signs up. And I would okay. I would favor something like that as, as well. But um, you know, it's I think we're lucky some you know, everybody's lucky nobody's been hurt by an accident at one of these intersections. So, so. what's your Yakabaga? I don't have a solution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I just want to comment about two experiences I had. I rode with a community officer in her cruiser. Couple once the first time was a couple of years ago, and it was distressing seeing all of the encampments, the unhoused populations, and people struggling. I rode again a couple of months ago, early June, and it was it was much better than a couple of years ago. Much better. Yeah, there were there were encampments here and there, tinier ones. But overall, I thought we are achieving an improvement and there is mm -hmm. progress and things are going in the right direction. The approach that the city um, uh, 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 adopted, I think it was working very well. And then suddenly something mm -hmm. happened. Right. And and I, I, I truly believe the city has done a tremendous job collecting data and working with these individuals. What happened, the influx of home, of unhoused individuals into our town, I mean, I know some of them are from out of town. I mean, it's very obvious. Me, myself, I haven't seen some of these faces because I drive in, the week, uh, in downtown. Anyway, I don't have a solution. I think if we try to go back on track on our plan, I think that at least we're doing our part. I, I don't know about what's going to happen in the future, to be honest. Um, I'm just, I feel helpless in a way because mm -hmm. I, I thought we were there and we were you know achieving some progress but i mean i don't know now to keep our citizens you know i mean safe and warm the unhoused in our community that we know about to keep them warm and safe during winter i think that's a priority others are there's that much we can do that's for Leonard. um I, I think uh, I think it's important to state to people that I think we've hit we've hit this topic over and over again that this is not anything that is unique to Bangor. This is being experienced all across the country, and there are many other states that have ways to deal with this solution. Uh, uh, Councillor Trumbull brought up what they're doing in Florida. Um, what's happening actually right now in New York? Um, they have mm -hmm. some of the best services in the entire world. And uh, every month, there are 10,000 new migrants that come into that state every single day. And, and they're a welcoming state uh, for, for migrants. But what's happening right now in, in just that one state is that their services and employees are being so overburdened that even Mayor Adams and uh, Governor Hochul have uh, both basically stated the federal government needs to get more involved into helping that state. We in Bangor, and you know, I, you know, I, I, I have some disagreements with uh, with Governor Mills every now and then, but I, I know she's trying to do as much good work as possible on this issue as well. Um, but we're drowning; we are absolutely drowning, and we're trying to come up with all these small little. Uh, edits and solutions to existing plans. And what, what I'm basically looking at here is we're at a point where we have to establish this is the plan for the year. This is what we have. We can't deviate from this. We have to execute. And we're in a state right now where we, we can look into other avenues of approach of how we deal with these uh, situations. But as we just saw with uh, with August, there was a huge influx of people that uh, that we were not taking into account uh, this summer, and it goes to show that 
anything can completely gum up our entire services in this city after spending countless hours trying to organize and communicate with other municipal leaders, county leaders, uh, the state legislature. And I, I just want to be very clear that that we are we are trying our best. I'm so thankful. Again, you know, I want to give a huge amount of credit for uh, Councilor Sprague really putting a huge fire onto, uh, onto our butts to say, this is our executable plan. We're going to go forward with this. My goal is this is uh, my hope is this is going to be goal actually yeah uh, that this is going to be a living breathing document that we edit every single year and we try to uh, attribute the things that we have learned from previous winters we assess them we try to accommodate those in the summer and then the fall we do preparation work for uh, um, how we're going to keep people alive in the winter and. I, I think it goes without saying our our public health department, our police force, our fire department, um, Parks like, and Rec, public works. No, I mean it, it's it's the entire city. The entire right. city is completely working around the clock around just this one issue, on top of a plethora of other ones. And um, all I can say is, please continue to be engaged. Please continue to. Uh, help when you can. I know I'm going to be uh, volunteering at some warming shelters this winter, um, but in any way, shape or form that you can participate and, and help Bangor get through this winter, it's going to be much appreciated and we need your help. Uh, we can only do so much. That's for sure. I just think that the only way I can describe how I feel about this is compassionately frustrated. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is, I feel like most counselors probably have that same thing. Like, yes, we want to be compassionate, but man, is it frustrating, mm -hmm. especially when there are folks that just, I, I you know, and, and I think most of us here are privileged enough to not have been in a situation where we had an adult in our lives that would absolutely not do anything to help themselves and would not, you know, I, I just can't even imagine what it's like for the family members of these folks who would want nothing more than for their loved one to be inside and to not be the person everybody is talking about. And those of us that are fortunate enough to not have that person as a relative, we're really lucky. But I, I don't have any solutions. I just wanted to make sure that the frustration, if you, you like around this table, you might hear some people erring on the side of compassion and some erring on the side of frustration, but I think we're all pretty much compassionately frustrated. Councilor Davit. Thank you. Yeah, I think that puts it really well. Um, I also just wanted to point out, like, as we talk about influx in Bangor, I mean, it's across the state and in towns that don't have any services. I mean, I'm just to count, like, everywhere. So um, people go where there aren't services to. Um, they're just trying to get somewhere. Um, I... Um, I appreciate what Council Leonard brought up about the state and federal and, and funding. And um, I mean, there's 100 million that um, Governor Mills had in a supplemental budget. I'm not quite sure. And I apologize if we've gotten this breakdown before, but in terms of how it might run through the city or if it's doing more rural areas, which also helps us. Um, I, I, we need to continue advocating at a, at a federal level, but in the meantime, we have to do what we can do for folks close to home. Um, so if if what what our community outreach folks think works best is mm -hmm. to continue okay. doing what we're doing behind the whole house to go back to your direct guidance you. ask. Um, but I would and the other piece I would remind folks of and Councillor Sprague brought this up many times is you know uh, a large portion of these people who are home, uh, folks who are homeless and unhoused mm -hmm. who are in their cars in particular have kids and are mm -hmm. working. Mm -hmm. um, so I just when we talk about it's really it's can be very easy to think of the person who's you know most likely not on their meds for their mental illness who's screaming in the street, um, which as someone who works in, works in downtown, well, I hear it literally. Um, but the we I just think especially when we get frustrated, um, myself included, it can be really easy to step away from the idea of these of everyone's humanity. Right. Um, and so that just constant reminder is also exhausting. I think. That's just I know. Concerned about that. I think this is an ongoing yeah. conversation. 
Um, I, and I, I think you appreciate all the comments that are being made. And I, I think we are frustrated by the, uh, the situation. Um, and just to tee up a couple of things, maybe to come back to. Yep. Um, I think we need to be very clear on what our legal parameters are. I saw a couple of postings just in the last couple of days about a new court case overturning an appeal of a case that was blocking uh, homeless people from on city property. And it basically left the door open to people camping out in the city as much as they want. Um, and I think we need to make sure that we clarify where we stand on what we can and cannot limit. I don't think we can provide very many limitations on people who are coming from away who just arrive here and say they want to be here and they want to camp. We're not going to be able to differentiate them between them and people who have lived outside in Bangor for the last year, I'm afraid. So, but I think we need to clarify that. Um, I would like to clarify where we are with the memo of understanding with the other agencies in town about their commitment to collaboration with the city to provide the services that are necessary to manage the patients in the account, the patients, <laughs> yeah. yeah, the residents of the encampments, because we get conflicting signs about who is do, willing to do what and what is PCHD willing to do and what's the city going to do and what are other outreach coordinators going to do. And we have, again, fragmentation in the commitment of you know what our outreach program is to these workers. And we were talking earlier tonight about another program that's going to be doing outreach without having a coordinated approach that's citywide to how we're doing outreach to people in need. So, you know, we're just, our earlier discussion would exacerbate a problem that we already have. I'm also very interested in knowing where the people are who are relocated from Valley Avenue, mm -hmm. where they are tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, are they in apartments? Are they sheltered? Have they drifted? Have they been given bus tickets? What's our experience in that encampment? And would we say that is a success? Because I know we've closed it down. And I know we've put up signs, but I don't have any. So from mm -hmm. that standpoint, it's a success. Mm -hmm. But I don't have any sense of whether it has been a success from where people are. Mm -hmm. And are they really better off now than they were before? Uh, so those I know would take the rest of the evening discussion. But so I'm just saying, if we could come back to those, that would be helpful because I think they all are pertinent to the extent of whatever tough love approach we adopt. So the Valley Avenue encampment update is underway. Um, some health and community services folks started that, and we're going to need to circle back with um, the direct workers who were involved to make sure that we're able to define specifically kind of all of the additional steps that were taken because there is no one place where all of the follow up was documented. So we need to go back to several folks. It, which is part of our problem. We don't have, you know, consistent follow-up and documentation that's coming in one place. Understood. And it's not even, the system and isn't even set up to do that. So, you know, yep. when we're talking about, I, I think when we're talking about where we should invest some of our ARPA dollars, we could very well use some of the money to spend to adopt a system that would give us adequate data to answer some of these questions. The uh, problem we have is the data is not owned by the city. It is under the control of the state of Maine through the HMIS system and the contract providers. All we can control and do is the data that yeah. we deal with. Uh, with a coordinated outreach program with all the outreach people from all of the Correct. agencies working we together, force that. we would force that. Correct. We can force and that. And if we don't have any data to, Understood. we can't evaluate, and then we don't know what crown we're standing on. Mm -hmm. More discussion to come. Manager updates. Just two quick things. Um, just to let folks know, we just um, are wrapping up our second CDL training class. Um, we had uh, 10, uh, 12 employees total 
uh, the city of Brewer began to partner with us and actually sent over a trainer to assist with a couple of um, classroom training portions. Um, everybody is working through their range and road training. Uh, six employees successfully completed their permit test on September 12th, another on the 21st. The other three had to reschedule. Um, no one has failed, their, uh, has failed to pass their permit test on the first try. Um, and um, we are well under our way to getting our training hours uh, behind us in anticipating employees will be taking a road test exams in late October. So we've continued to build on that. It's kind of public work night. So you may remember about uh, 30 or 30 days ago or so, we told you that there were 127 people who hadn't paid for their additional trash bin. We're down to 23. <laughs> and which means they've been getting notices for a month, and which means this week we're going to discontinue trash service to their entire house. That should bring compliance. And that's all I had. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Chairman. Uh, we'll be going to executive sessions under one MRS 4056A. Uh, personnel matter, there's three of those, and one MRS 4056E. Consultation with the next year. Second. Okay, we have a second roll call vote. Councilor Trumbull? Yes. Councilor Yakabaga? Yeah. Councilor Leonard? Yes. Councilor Schaefer? Yeah. Councilor Davis? Yeah. Councilor Craig? Yes. I'll make it unanimous. Yes, you know.